The final clause of the train order we receive at Nashua tells the whole status of the Hillsboro Branch. Conductor G. A. Tilton shows me the order. It directs our northbound freight to meet the southbound train at South Merrimack and adds, almost morosely, not protecting against following extras. Those five words mean that we are on a line so little used that grass grows almost unchallenged between the rails, that ours is an upcountry branch shrunken and shriveled, forgotten by all but a handful of railroad men and shippers. To the railroad men, those five words mean this branch has seen its day. It is entirely a has-been. To me, too, they were melancholy words until late in the afternoon. Then, when I was returning to Nashua by bus, the five words lost much of their somberness and despair. Railroad procedure puts upon a crew the duty of protecting its train. If it makes an unscheduled stop, the flagman must walk back down the track, ready to signal any following train until it halts. But on the Hillsboro branch, there won't be any following train. Ours is the only up train for the entire day, and the dispatcher knows it. It was this way yesterday, the day before, the day before that, and back into the Depression years when the Hillsboro, like many other branches in sparsely settled country, came into the shadows. There simply won't be another train until tomorrow. But even so, the rules demand that our rear brakeman, Robert Sargent, take his flag and plod down the track, utterly needless. And so the dispatcher, a realistic man, adds those five words, not protecting against following extras, and thereby frees Sargent of the need of flagging. The dispatcher uses the word extras because on the Boston and Maine, only first class or passenger trains are shown in the timetable. All freights, even those that hold day after day to the same running time, are extras. There haven't been passenger trains on the Hillsboro branch for years. Our little extra, once we meet the down train, will have the line all to itself. My trip up the Hillsboro branch began long before this morning. It began when I wrote George Hill that I wished to ride a peddler freight. The name peddler is good in mid-America language and means a slow freight that stops anywhere to leave or take on to peddle shipments. When Hill replied that he had arranged a freight trip, he put peddler in quotation marks. I asked Henry Bewley why. We call them local freights on this road, Henry wrote back. When you say peddler, you mark yourself as not from this country. Although the Hillsboro branch juts off from Nashua, our train will start at Lowell, 13 and 4 tenths miles south. We'll haul one string of cars from Lowell to Nashua, leave them there, and pick up our Hillsboro cars. Thus, we give the branch its daily service and also keep a main line through freight from bothering with local Lowell to Nashua cars. That double duty gives the company more use from the 1455 and also makes a full day's work for the crew. Indeed, if traffic should be unexpectedly heavy, the men might collect an hour of overtime. We found our crew standing by in the engine and chatting. Andrew Kate, 40 years on the B&M, was the engine man. His fireman was Joe Bugley, only six years on the road. Conductor Tilt, the senior crewman, had been with the road 45 years. The head brakeman, Norman Savage, started with the B&M bus system in 1928 and then shifted into train work. Sergeant, the rear brakeman, had nine years of seniority. At certain grade crossings, Kate stops until Joe Buckley can pick up a red flag and go ahead to warn highway traffic. With one train a day, the branch doesn't justify several thousand dollars for an automatic wigwag or flashing signal for a highway only mediumly traveled.
Most of the time now we are climbing, but the rise isn't steady. Every now and then we dip down. Now there are no signals to watch. When we left the high iron at Nashua, we went out of the world of green and yellow and red lights. On the branch, all control is by train orders, telegraphed by the dispatcher to a station operator and relayed by him to the train crew. And we have had our order, number 74, with its forlorn, not protecting clause. I begin to wonder why the Boston and Maine bothers at all with the Hillsborough branch, why it doesn't just close out the whole business. Before the Depression, the Hillsborough line was longer, part of a network that stretched into many of the towns back of Nashua and Concord. Almost wherever a countryman lived, he could board a morning passenger train to the city and ride another home in late afternoon in time for supper. Now only a few stubby branches remain, and on a single one of them, from Worcester in Massachusetts to New Hampshire's Peterborough, are their passenger trains. The line from Concord to Claremont is close enough to a high iron not to be counted as a branch. Why fight an economic inevitability, I ask myself. Why not write off these few remaining lines, tear them up, and say, this used to be railroad country a long time ago, very long ago. Then I remember the Gandhi dancers. The B&M wouldn't be repairing track it expected to forsake soon. Perhaps there is some excuse for continuing the Hillsborough run, although I haven't seen it yet. Every few minutes, Joe Buckley puts his foot on the lever that swings open the firebox door. He throws in coal, one or two scoopfuls at a time. The mogul swaying isn't enough to make him miss. Always the coal goes into the firebox, none of it spilling on the floor. Yet after every second or third shoveling, Buckley takes a broom and carefully sweeps the floor. He and Andrew Kate are good housekeepers. At South Milford, we cut out a tank car at the Standard Oil plant. Buckley tells me we must drop more cars soon because the big hill is so steep that seven or eight cars are all the mogul can drag. Suppose we had a dozen cars? Well, we'd pull six or seven to the top, leave them, and come back for the others, he answers. At Milford, we get rid of some LCL, less than carload lot freight. Conductor Tilton and Brakeman Sergeant and Savage are busy with hand trucks, trundling these little shipments out of the local or way car. Buckley isn't required to help, but the day is hot and he knows the train crew will be perspiring, so he, too, helps with the unloading. I look at the boxes and crates and other goods in the local car. A wheelbarrow is going to Hillsboro. Some gallon cans of Sears Roebuck paint are in transit to Antrim. We have two boxes of General Electric light bulbs, other boxes of Kleenex, a carton of crate paper Halloween cups from the C.A. Reed Company of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, is part of our freight. Plumber's equipment for John J. Carey is in one corner of the car. Near a door are cans of poultry food. A box of Hallmark greeting cards is in the car. We are carrying garden hose, too. Spiegel's mail order house at Chicago has given us a shipment of small furniture, crated. A Montgomery Ward canoe is another one of our items. A box car on another track has Milford's new and glistening fire truck. Came yesterday and hasn't been unloaded yet. From Kleenex to fire trucks is the load of the Hillsboro local. Perhaps the mid-America wording, pedal of freight, is better than the B&M's word, local. For certainly, we are bringing into these New Hampshire towns a more varied assortment of goods than any old-time peddler jammed and crowded into his overloaded wagon. The old fellow surely didn't have bars of angle iron and a bottled gas stove in his load, but we have them today. That we are outdoing the old peddler may be the truly good reason the Hillsboro branch deserves to continue. The communities, few and mostly small, that cluster beside it, need our local train. John J. Carey needs his plumber materials, and October evenings will be much the merrier because of those crepe paper Halloween cups from Pennsylvania. There's no magnificence about the Hillsboro local, and no associated press photographer will snap a picture for nationwide circulation of our train puffing into Antrim or Elmwood. We're not protecting against falling extras, but we are helping our towns to live more completely. The hill behind us, Buckley stands in the narrow passageway between engine and tender and leans slightly out. Wind whips his face. He has crammed hard work into these last 25 minutes. He's tired. In a moment or so, he's on the seat again. It makes me think of my old, old home so many miles away to hear the song of that we poor we as he sings his evening lay.
Schedules aren't always comfortable. If I were to stay on the train through to Hillsboro, I should miss the afternoon Boston and Maine bus back to Nashua and my next bit of railroading. I must leave the train at Greenfield. I cannot go through to Bennington where a paper mill in Antrim, where a children's playthings factory furnished business for the local. At Hillsboro, end of what's left of the line, the train and engine crews will go by automobile to Concord, where most of the men live. Each day, one man provides a car to carry the whole group. Mogul 1455 will be attended to by a railroad watchman, who will see to it through the night, but the fire remains high enough to keep the boiler warm. Next morning, the crew will drive down from Concord and operate the local, not protecting against the following extras, back to Nashua and Lowell. Pointing to a trestle a few feet ahead, Buckley says, that's why we can't use heavier engines on this line. The bridge wouldn't stand the weight. Since the local usually has few enough cars that it can drag them up the hill in one haul instead of dividing the train and making two trips, there's no chance the B&M will replace this modest trestle with something husky enough to take the weight of a Mikado or consolidation. No, the mobile, 410 tons, is the biggest the Hillsboro branch will see. crew, I tell engineman Andrew Kate as I pull off Henry Bewley's short-legged overalls. Kate's answer is, they're the best on the road. A moment later, I'm walking towards the village. A half handful of houses, Greenfield is a most quiet village. Soon the bus comes. When the driver stows sacks of mail into the baggage closet, I notice that the bus is marked as seating 29 passengers. At no time on the run to Nashua were there more than five passengers. That was one reason why the Hillsborough branch is a once-a-day line. A one-man bus may make expenses with the mail bolstering the faint passenger revenue, but a five-man train couldn't possibly meet its costs. With few villages and small, the region hardly needs even a bus, for the family automobile solves most personal transportation problems. Yes, the Hillsboro branch is a complete has-been so far as passengers are concerned. But the carton of Halloween paper cups, the Milford fire truck, the Abbott Company's textile machinery, and John J. Carey's plumbing equipment are enough to keep the branch in use. After all, we had to pull more than the maximum allowed tonnage up the big hill. The peddler had his individual place a century ago, and today the peddler freight, I still prefer that name, does a job that was too big for him. Old Mogul 1455 isn't a museum piece yet. <laughs>